know, it's really, it's a fitting week to wrap up this series that we've been doing on the end because it's been, uh, in many ways, a week of beginnings and ends. And, and many of you know some of the things that have gone on around here and within the San Jose family in the past week or two, but, um, you know, we've, in, in one day yesterday, had a funeral in the morning and a wedding in the evening the end and the beginning of a new family. We've had a a baby born in the last two weeks and and another funeral coming up. It It is emotionally taxing, it's difficult, but it reminds us that this world that we live in is is based on beginnings and ends. Things start and they come to an end. And that's what everything is, and we understand that. And sometimes it's difficult. We don't like it, how things end, or when things end, but it's part of life as we know it. And as we come to the conclusion of this series, which is the conclusion of conclusions, we realize it's not really an end, it's a beginning. And the, the, I'm going to confuse myself here. But the end, that is a beginning, has no end. It is a a new thing that is coming, and that cycle of beginnings and ends will be no more. There will not be a time then where we look and say, oh, I'm sad that this person passed away or that this event happened because that's all going to be over. And this cycle that we've been living in that we know as life will come to an end, and that's the beauty of it. When we just stand in his presence. And so we're looking at this today, and, and we're not going to, I, I want to warn you ahead of time in case you were hoping for this, we're not going to get into all the little details. Uh, we're looking at the, we're looking at the new heaven and earth that, that God is going to bring down post-millennium, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. And as we look at that, we realize this is something new that God is bringing. It is something special that God is bringing. And it is really something that whether you believe specifically what we're teaching from Scripture or whether you believe something totally out there, most people on this planet believe that an end is coming. And and so we're not going to get into the minutia. You know, if, if you really look at the Scripture there's, there's some specifics there that are somewhat confusing. As John said, we can't wrap our head around a cube-shaped city. Figure that one out, but it's in there. Uh, but we're not going to get into all those details because we want to look at the bigger picture. And I'm not saying those details aren't important. They are very important, but we want to look at this from a different angle today. And so like I said, people almost universally realize that there's something more that when when this life ends whether it's our life individually or the the earth that we live on when this ends there's something more out there and whether it's you know christianity or islam or buddhism or judaism or any other there's generally some belief that there's something more out there the interesting thing is if you talk to missionaries that go out into the middle of the jungles of south america or the deserts of africa and they find some people group that nobody's ever found before and they learn their language and they talk to them you're going to find out they believe there's something more to this life And I've heard those stories over and over of of missionaries finally getting to the point where they can communicate with a people group and they share with them the truth about God. And they said, oh yeah, we didn't know what to call him. We called him this. We thought he was the sun. We thought he was a tree, but we knew he was out there. People know because Ecclesiastes 3 says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. He has created us with this understanding that There's more than this 80, 90, 100 years that we have on this earth. And so we want to look at this and understand how this happens and what is taking place. And when we do, we realize again that the end is really the beginning. It is something that God is bringing about. And the neat thing about God 
is that he does things differently than us for good reason. We tend to, you know, when we get our hands on something, we just mess it up. So we think of ourselves as creative and some more than others. You know, you, you may not consider yourself a creative person, but some are very creative people and we think of all the things that we create. But when you really boil it down, we don't create anything. You know, we might say, I, you know, I, I create art. If, if you go out in the, in the lobby on your way out, um, Diana has been working on some artwork on the chalkboard in there. Um, you know, she went and had a baby. And so, you know, it's, it's on pause right now, but it's beautiful art. And we could say she's creating this art, but she didn't create the chalk. You know, we, we can't create the way that God creates. We can't create music. We use notes and we use instruments and we use our voices. We didn't create those things. But when God creates something, he creates out of nothing. And, and talk to, when you get a chance, somebody in the scientific community and they'll tell you that's not possible. But that's exactly what God does. There, there's a saying and, and you know, a famous Latin saying, I won't say it in Latin because apparently that language is dead, but there's a saying in the scientific community, out of nothing, nothing comes. If there's nothing, nothing's gonna come out of nothing. And God takes that and says, watch this. That's how he created everything in the beginning. Out of nothing, God creates the heavens and the earth. And he, so he creates differently than us. We may be creative, we may use a canvas and paint, we may take a piece of paper and a pencil and use words and create a story, but we don't create like God creates. And so as we talked a few weeks ago about the millennial kingdom, we learned that the primary purpose of that period, that thousand year period, was for God to fulfill promises that he made. I'm going to give you this land and I'm going to give you a king to sit on a, a literal throne in this literal city. But the millennial kingdom has its limitations. It's, it's there for a purpose, but during that time, sin will still exist because there's going to be people born into this world during that time. Now, this, this earth is corrupted by sin. You look in Genesis 3, Isaiah 24, the, there's a curse on this earth because of sin. Satan's going to be bound during that time, unable to deceive the nations, but he won't be completely defeated yet. So there's limitations in this. The final judgment will not have taken place yet. And so the, the millennial reign of Christ is a magnificent time, peace, prosperity, long life, good health, wonderful, amazing period of time on this earth like there's never been before. But it won't be perfect. And God is not in the business of making things good. He's in the business of making things perfect. Perfect. When he creates, he creates out of nothing something perfect and special. He's not in the business of repairing what's broken. He's in the business of making things new. And that's what we see when we look at the new heaven and earth that comes in at the end of Revelation. He's saying, behold, I'm making all things new. Not behold, I'm fixing all this old stuff. I'm making it new, something completely new. So that millennial kingdom is a vitally important part in God's redemptive story because it's, it's ending the narrative of this earth. God created it. He created it perfect, like we said. We messed it all up. And he's going to finish that story in a way that brings him glory with Jesus sitting on the throne. But in order to make things the way that God makes things, the old has to go away and the new has to come. And that's what God does. So he will create something out of nothing, bringing a new heaven and a new earth. So if you've got your Bible, I hope you do, uh, open to Revelation chapter 20. If you don't have one, there's a Bible there in the pew rack. Revelation chapter 20. Before we get to the new heaven and earth, there's a few things that have to take place at the conclusion of the millennium before the new heaven and new earth come in. So we're going to Look at those quickly and then examine 
the new heaven and new earth that God brings in. Those two events are the final defeat of Satan and the great white throne judgment that God is going to bring on those who don't believe. So Revelation 20, starting in verse 7, we see the defeat of Satan. And when the thousand years are ended... Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we see here the the final defeat. Satan has been bound for a thousand years, unable to deceive the nations. Jesus is on the throne in Jerusalem presiding over this new worldwide kingdom. It's peaceful. It's prosperous. Everything is good. People don't go hungry. There's no wars. But again, as we've mentioned, during this time... There will be some who enter the millennium in natural bodies. That would be those who live through the tribulation, who are followers of Jesus. When Jesus returns, they enter into the millennium in their natural bodies, and so they will naturally have children through that time. And not all of them will believe. Shockingly as it would be, with Jesus literally sitting on the throne, there will still be some who rebel That sin nature goes deep, people, and they will rebel against him. And so when when Satan comes and he's released, he's going to gather together these people who have chosen to not follow Jesus for one last weak attempt at a final battle. And so the question you may have is, how is their number like the sand of the seashore? Like if... If Jesus is literally on the throne in this worldwide kingdom where he is the king ruling with a, a rod of iron, how are there so many people that don't believe? Well, the simple answer is a thousand years is a long time. A lot of people can be born in a thousand years, especially if there's no wars and there's no famines and there's no disease. Imagine how many people can be born. So just the population in general of the earth will probably be, well, definitely be greater than anything we've ever seen. For, for reference, from 1900 to the year 2000, 100 years, the population went from 2 billion to over 6 billion. So the population tripled in 100 years. What can happen in 1,000 years? One person tried to estimate how much a population could grow over a thousand years, starting with just 100 people using all the the modern figures, you know, how many children do people have? What's the average age of, of motherhood? What's life expectancy based on things right now? And they said a hundred people could turn into 4.9 billion in a thousand years. So what happens when people live eight or 900 years And there's no wars and there's no famines. We could be talking crazy numbers on the earth. So that's why we see this group of people as numerous as the sands on the seashore rebelling against Jesus, those who have not believed. But as we said, that's it's not even a battle. Just like when Jesus returned in the second coming, as we discussed. They're all ready for battle, and he goes and destroys them with the sword that comes out of his mouth. Well, this time, they're going to gather around the city, and before the battle even begins, fire comes from heaven and consumes them. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Well, he will be tormented day and night for eternity. That's the end of Satan. So following this final rebellion and the destruction of Satan will be what we call the great white throne judgment. We already discussed the judgment seat of Christ where believers will stand before him and give an account and be rewarded according to what we've done. But we, we learn here that those who don't believe will not be judged until after the thousand years. So those who have died on this earth who did not believe, they will not be resurrected until after that 
and only to be judged. And so this is what we see. Uh, Continue on in chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When when we talk about the end... We have to realize that this is, this is the end for those who don't believe. This is the conclusion for those who tr- do not trust in Jesus. And sometimes we, we like to just kind of push that out of our minds and just pretend like that's not a reality, but this is exactly what it is. For those who have not trusted in Jesus, for those whose names are, are not written in the book of life, It says they are thrown into the lake of fire, the same lake of fire that he said when Satan was thrown in, they would be tormented day and night forever and ever. We don't like to think about it, but it's a reality, and it should give us urgency to tell others about the hope that we have in Jesus, those that need to hear that there is a way, that there is hope. And so we see these two events, the defeat of Satan, the final judgment. We saw in what we just read, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Even death is judged and thrown into the fire. It's gone now. And so with that, with with Satan gone, with sin gone, with death gone, all of these things gone, instead of just doing a quick renovation of the earth... God does what he always does, and he creates new, something brand new, our final home, our final destination. So look in chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. There shall be that neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murders, murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. He says, behold, I am making all things new. The old is gone. The new has come. In the end, God is not going to just spruce up the earth. He's, He's going to wipe it away and create a new heaven and a new earth. It's likely here that heaven, as he talks about it here, is not heaven like we normally think about it, where God's dwelling place is, because God's dwelling place is going to be here with us. And so it's, it's likely that this is more a reference to the atmosphere and to space. He's creating this new. So throughout scripture, you see that also where heaven is, is 
the dwelling place of God, but now God's dwelling place is with man. So we also see throughout Scripture, heaven is mentioned as the heavens, the, you know, where, you, where the, the sun and the moon and stars and all those things are. Verse 23 in that, we see that the new Jerusalem does not need sun, moon, and stars because God himself is the light. So this new, these new heavens that he's creating, you know, before we have to, or right now, we have to look out. And, and if you get a chance, take some time, look out in the night sky and see the stars and the moon. And, and it shows us a glimpse of the glory of God. Look at the creation on the earth. Go look at the mountains and the seas. And you see a glimpse of the glory of God. We won't need that anymore. We won't need glimpses. We won't need to look out at the stars and the galaxies and say, ooh, look how big God is because he's going to be with us. And so this new heaven and new earth is, will, will be different because God will be here with us. In this new heaven and earth, we're told that God will dwell with us. Not like he did with the Israelites in the tabernacle and the temple where his, his glory was, uh, it, but nobody had access to it except once a year. God will dwell with us in the fullness of his glory where we will have access to, to him. He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. You ready for that? Ready for no more crying, no more pain, no more death. The former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. Sometimes we forget as we look to the, the end and we, we, we hope for those things and we long for those things when all things are made new, we forget sometimes that the victory is already won. Here, here he says, it is done. But don't forget, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The victory's been won. Now we're just having to wait a little while for the ultimate fulfillment of that victory when he makes all things new. And so what I want to do is I want to look today about how this, how this is what God does. He makes all things new. And we can sit here today and we can, we can long for that time, and I hope we do. I hope we long for that day when, when Jesus returns and when we have this new heaven and earth, when we're in an, our eternal state. But God's already making all things new. That's what he does. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at how God is already doing these things. As we wait for the end, as we wait for the new heaven and earth, we realize God is not a God who renovates. He's a God who recreates. And he's doing that in us, and he's done that in us. So I want to look at a few things that God has done for us if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not, something God can do for you today. God can do this for you today if you're not a follower of Jesus. He's going to make all things new and we wait for that. But right now, he's still in the business of recreating. He's still in the business of making things new. So the first thing we see in scripture that God makes new is he gives us a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Prior to, prior to coming to faith in Christ, Scripture teaches we have a heart of stone. And you may know some people that have a heart of stone. But when we come to faith in Christ, the, the beautiful picture is God doesn't take that heart of stone and, and change it and fix it and repair it. He says he removes it and gives us a new heart, brand new, a heart that can pump life through our veins into our bodies as we live for Jesus. 
You know, when, he, when you hear of a person who receives a heart transplant, maybe you know some, some people who've gone through that and received a heart transplant, it's true they get a new heart, but it's more than, than just the heart, it's the life. A new heart means new life. It means hope. It means a future for someone in a physical sense in this world that gets a heart transplant. That's what it means. It means you're going to live another day, hopefully many more years, because this new life that you have, that's the same for us spiritually. When we receive this new heart, we receive new life, which is the life of Christ. So he gives us a... He gives us a new heart which breathes into us new life. Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, By the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's the picture of baptism. We we go down into the water just like Jesus died and was buried. And when we're raised up, it's not that we're raised up a better person. It's not that we're raised up as just a clean person or a wet person. We're a new person. The old is gone. The new has come. He's given us new life, just like that person who's received that heart transplant. We receive that heart transplant, we get that heart of stone removed, and we receive a heart of flesh, and it pumps the life of Christ through our bodies. Likewise, when we receive this new heart, this new life, we also receive a new spirit. The Holy Spirit. Ezekiel said it. We already read that verse. I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. Not a, not a better version of our spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit. John 16, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Romans 8, 9 through 11 says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I think sometimes, and and maybe, maybe you're not this way, maybe it's just me, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit kind of gets put a little lower on on the totem pole and we forget that he is fully God and he dwells within us. You know, that's why scripture says our body is the temple. Just like the God dwelled in the temple in Jerusalem, he dwells in us. The same, according to Romans 8, the same spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Do we realize that kind of power that we have within us? He doesn't just give a tune-up. He doesn't just fix up our, our junky old spirit. He gives us a new one. He puts himself in us. And this is why Jesus could say in the Great Commission that he would be with us until the end of the age. He is truly with us all the time gives us a new heart. He gives us new life. He gives us a new spirit. He gives us a new covenant. In Christ, God made a a new covenant that made a way for us to be saved. Eternal, paid for by the blood of Jesus. Again, he didn't just take the old one and make it better. He gave us a new one. For generations Before God was telling us about this, Jeremiah says this, chapter 31, 
It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This new covenant makes salvation available. To the, from the least to the greatest, everyone is welcomed into the family of God. Hebrews tells us that the sacrifice of Jesus was once for all. Not something that he's got to go up to the temple over and over and offer a sacrifice, but one time for all people, he made that sacrifice for our sins. He didn't just fix up the old covenant he didn't go in and, and do some amendments to make it better. He made a new covenant, and he made a way for all of us. He also makes us a new creation. Now, we're talking about the, the new heaven and earth. That's a new creation, but he tells us, you are a new creation. You know, there's a lot of books. If you, if you go on Amazon, you go to the bookstore, you go find a lot of books about your best self, you know, you can get some help being the best person you can be and, and making yourself the best, your best self and having your best life. Don't read those books. <clears throat> I don't even know what they are, but don't read them. Here's what you need to know. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say this very delicately. Your best self is awful. <laughs> Your best self is not good enough. Neither is mine. We don't need our best self. We need a new self. We need him to make us new. The old is gone. The new has come. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a new creation. That's why Jesus says you have to be born again. This, this weird concept that was weird to, to the people Jesus told that to originally, and it's weird in the world right now. You talk about being born again, and people look at you crazy, because that's weird, but that's what we need. Not a, not a refreshing of our current life, but a new life. Born again, a new person. That's what God does. He is in the business of making things new. Now, some days you may not feel like it, but you're a new creation if you're in Christ. And finally, God gives us a new purpose. He gives us this new heart pumping life through our veins. He gives us the Holy Spirit to live within us and guide us and, and walk with us. He's given us a new covenant to make all of this possible through the blood of Jesus. He's made us new creations, and as new creations, he's given us a new purpose. I love looking at the stories of, of Jesus' disciples when he goes to them and, and tells them, you know, put down your nets. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to give you a new purpose. Walk away from that and come and follow me. Walk away from, from your, your tax table and come and follow me. I'm giving you a new purpose. I'm giving you something new to do. I mean, that, that was their job. They fished for fish. And, and Jesus says, I got, I got a new job for you. I have a new purpose for you. Now you're going to be fishers of men. That's the significance, by the way, when you see after Jesus died and before the resurrection and it shows those guys, what are they doing? They're back fishing for fish. They don't know what to do. And so they go back to what they know not realizing that this purpose that Jesus gave them to be fishers of men was still true. That's our new purpose, to follow Jesus, to, 
to leave that old life and go chasing after him every single day, to go and fish for people and tell them about Jesus, to become like Jesus, to be obedient to his call. That's what this, that's why he made us a new creation, for his glory, for his purpose. God is making all things new. He's going to make all things right. But right now, if you're a follower of Jesus, he's made you new. He's made you into a new creation and has given you a new purpose. And I, I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else. You may, you may not feel like it. You may not feel worthy. You may not feel useful. But listen, hear this. God doesn't make worthless things. God doesn't make useless things. If you are new in Christ, he has made you for his purpose with hope and with meaning for your life. Live in that new creation. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, you can, you can have all this. And I'm not saying life will be perfect and everything, all your problems will just melt away and your bank account will be full and your house will be nicer and your car will be fancy. What I am saying is that stuff's not going to matter quite as much when you leave that behind and just go following after Jesus, go chasing after Jesus. That can be your life. The new heaven and new earth, they, they represent our glorious hope for eternity. That's where we're going to be. The end will be the beginning, and the beginning will never end when that time comes. But they also show us that our God is a God who makes all things new. Right now, he is making things new. He's going to do it again when he defeats Satan, when he judges, and there will be no more sin, there will be no more death, there will be no more tears all of that stuff will pass away. Those who experience this are the ones whose names are written in that book of life that he talked about. So the question is, have you been made new? Have you been made new? If you are new, if you're a new creation, remember God doesn't make worthless things. He doesn't make useless things. He's got something for you. He has a purpose and a calling for you. Live every day for him. If you haven't, surrender. Trust in faith that Jesus' sacrifice was enough to cover your sins. And he will give you a new heart and a new spirit and a new purpose and a new life. He'll give all of that to you out of his grace. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are a creative God. Not creating like we create, but making things new out of nothing. We thank you, God, that you are able to make us new even in this life, in these bodies of flesh, on this earth that is corrupted by sin, you can give us a new heart and a new spirit and a new purpose. You can make us a new creation to live for you every day. God, I thank you that you don't make useless and worthless things. You make things perfect. And you are able to make us perfect. You are able to make us righteous, not by what we've done, but by what Jesus did on the cross. He was the one that was perfect. He was the one that lived the life that we couldn't live. And he sacrificed that life so that when we trust in him, he would look at us you would look at us, God, and see the righteousness of your son. You would see that new creation.
God, we love you. We thank you so much for making us new. And Lord, I pray right now for those that are here, for those that are watching online that have never trusted in Jesus for salvation, that they would understand they can be new, not better, not their best self, but a new creation in Christ with worth and with meaning, with the power of the Holy Spirit living in them and empowering them to live for you with purpose Lord, I pray today would be the day that they would accept that free gift of salvation. Trust in you. So that their name would be written in the book of life. That they would experience the new heaven and earth where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more mourning or crying, no more death, no more sin. Just an eternity in your presence. a new beginning that has no end. We long for that day. But until that day comes, Lord, remind us of our purpose. Remind us of the urgency to go and tell others that there is hope only in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.